I am reminded that activism should also be joyful, which is a good thing to remember, will keep us in the work. It's a good thing I was reminded of that just now, because last week I spent one of the days of this Passover week at Auschwitz. It's not like you think that Auschwitz will be easy, but how awful it is did take me by surprise. Most of us who went together sat for hours, days, maybe we're still sitting with the ways the awfulness layers in and stays with you. Certainly one part was to realize all the layers of evil and normalizing of evil that interconnected there. It was having it dawn on you, all the people who had to play their part in the whole of it, in everything it took to run the camp, each horrific part of it, none of it humane, let alone kind or protective. All the values we treasure stripped away. I will spare you the details, the various wards and buildings and what happened in them, the visuals and descriptions, because to do so without warnings and chaplains on hand in the back to hold you isn't fair. A loved one's mother who lost half of her family in the Holocaust and suffered through the war, pale and lightheaded, her daughter told me when she went on the tour. And the woman's father she thought was at risk of a heart attack. Which is to say it's one thing to know about it and quite another to stand in the presence of it. This was not a one bad actor reality or a few sick people to blame, but this whole world conspiring. And having, you hit, having that hit you in the face isn't just hard because you realize the human capacity for evil or are reminded of it, our ability to conspire for evil, but also I think in part because you can't help but walk away and then look at your own life and work with those same eyes and see the way in which small and large you are playing your part in the evils of your day. Homelessness, or the lack of universal health care, racism, or a nation in which the zip code in which you're born still is the best predictor of your health outcomes, your longevity, your lifespan, your earnings, your education. A world of despots and our own homegrown ones, home-nurtured tyrants and their opportunistic, sycophantic retinue of apologists and supporters human suffering in war, in poverty, in climate displacement. Gaza, Myanmar, Ukraine, being queer in Uganda or Adivasi in India, or trans and a teen in Florida, or pregnant and an incest survivor in Texas. Pick one or all of those, or the ones that come to you and see your part in a larger world that allows them to play out, it's sobering to say the least, isn't it? And add to this insight the painful part of seeing the evil in the world and the pain in the world and realizing how often one pain rolls inevitably into the creation of the next. It, how ghettoized Jews liberated ghettoized Palestinians, how poor marginalized people, oppressed people of any kind, anywhere in the world, so often perpetuate marginalization and oppression on whatever group the hierarchy of identity says can be less than them, can be treated as such, but also in this legacy of pain, I recently read in the minister's book group book that we're reading that 70% of those in our prison system in California were once children in our foster care system. So how pain and brokenness and evil so often, very often, too often has its own momentum All of that is disheartening and despairing to see in the world. 
that ability for passive collective surrender and active collaboration with systems of evil, the momentum of evil and pain and patterns of brokenness to carry forward. And together, that's such a scary set of forces to know in your bones are at work in the world and stand face to face with. That was part of my Passover week, this deep immersion in reflection on the pharaohs of our own making and participation in through time. And this last week, the same week that I stood at Auschwitz and paid my respects, I spent most of my time in the presence of something else that is also at work in the world. And it's this piece that feels particularly relevant to talk about on this Sunday when I wanted us to think a little bit about this idea of legacy. Some of you may know the story already of Martha and Wait Still Sharp. If you do, if those names sound familiar, yeah, about half a dozen of you. Ken Burns, the great documentarian of our time, did a documentary on them in 2016 called Defying the Nazis, the Sharps War. For those who don't know them, the story is pretty straightforward and it comes from the Unitarian side of our Unitarian Universalist family tree. The story begins with a young couple who are in their lives very committed to social justice. She's a social worker who's actually gotten an education against her family's wishes. Um, he is a man who's gone to law school and then decided that ministry is where and how he wants to be of service instead. The year is late 1938. The Nazis have invaded northern Czechoslovakia, and Prague is filling up with refugees. Wait still was serving in Wellesley, Massachusetts at the church there, and he gets a call from the president of the association telling him that times are grave and he needs the young minister and his wife to go to Europe and help with the needs that are arising in Prague among the refugees. The minister reminds the man on the other end of the phone that he has two young children and this might not be a great time. The president presses hard and talks about how difficult times require difficult sacrifices. And the minister asks, out of curiosity, whether the president has asked any other people if they're willing to make this sacrifice. And the president says, yes, 17 people before you and they all turned me down. For whatever reason, Wait Still and Martha say yes, and they leave their children in the care of their church community, and they go to Prague in the February of 1939 to aid with the refugee crisis that's unfolding there. Within two weeks, the Nazis annex the remainder of Czechoslovakia, including Prague, and the Sharps are thrown into being part of an underground network of people helping mostly journalists and political dissidents and academics who are most at risk in the moment help them escape. And they do so for months until wait still, trying to return from a trip, probably trying to get papers approved and smuggled in. A trip from Switzerland has his papers that would allow him to re-enter Czechoslovakia, has them revoked, and he's unable to return to his wife and they hear rumors of their planned arrest circulating. And so they both return home to Massachusetts. It's at the end of August in 1939 when they do so, just days before World War II will break out officially. Within the year, they are back again, this time to help with the evacuation of refugees from Lisbon and France, still helping to get food and papers and visas, anything they can do to assist the folks and the needs that are arising. Martha arranges the evacuation of children, including an airplane of them, an effort that would serve as the model for kinder transport in the war. 
Eventually, they return home again. Their children remember the time without them. Their marriage does not survive long after they return home. They continue to do whatever work they can from this side of the ocean. Their gift to the world, in other words, has a price, and after their deaths, Martha and Wait Still Sharp would be the second and third Americans to be designated as righteous among the nations, that title that's granted by Israel's memorial to the Holocaust, to non-Jews who risk their lives to save Jews during the Holocaust. Their story is at the heart of the founding of the Unitarian, now Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, whose mission is still, as they state it, to advance human rights and social justice around the world, partnering with those who confront unjust power structures and mobilizing to challenge oppressive policies. There's a table in the lobby. If you're not already a member, you can join. We take offerings multiple times through the years, through the year, and other ways we connect with the work. John Behrens is responsible for my husband being recruited to the board, which is why I got to go to Poland as a also ran in the planning. So I was in Poland this week with the service committee as the plus one to my husband. Because each year, the organization, at least prior to pandemic, would take board members and a couple other key supporters to visit some of the partners that they work with. And with Russia's war of aggression on Ukraine and Poland being on the receiving end of the largest number of refugees from that war, and the UUSC having raised and granted emergency grants, which we also contributed to, to help fund whatever was needed, we were part of and connected to the front lines of what this crisis has meant. We met all kinds of activists and ordinary people who became organizers and activists out of necessity. Most were women and women-led organizations, which I think speaks both to the lens of those who often don't get funding as easily, something that the USC pays attention to, but also I think that larger truth that those on the margins of a society often can see unmet needs and injustices more clearly than those who are naturally put at the center. Poland, if you don't know, is a very Catholic, very homogenous nation still very traditional in its mores, with a lot of marginalized groups who need allyship and more than allies need what you might call accomplices or what the USC often refers to as partners. Some of who we met or the organizations are pictured in the cover of the order of service. That's the sharps at the center, like the center of a wheel, with the spokes being the most recent groups that we met with or their leaders. Some of these groups had origins that pre-existed the war between Russia and Ukraine, but all saw their work grow tremendously in the last two years, and for different but very interconnected reasons. The first day, I'd love to give you just a sense of who was there, because I think it'll feel good to hear about them. The first day, we met this group of women activists who were supporting other activists who face burnout. The name of the organization is translated as Regenerative. This group that was small and mighty that tries to offer and help people access counseling services, who have kind of secondary PTSD from the work they're doing often, who offer leaders resources for care, self-care, even things as simple as meditation and journaling, and schedule retreats for activists so that they can stay in the work, which is so hard right now. 
Right now, the organization, even as it's raising money so that activists can have sabbaticals, they had just signed papers on a piece of land in the country where they're going to build a couple of cabins so that folks can go there for personal retreats where they can go out into nature. Nature walks being one of the things they offer that we all did as a way to find a natural, holistic way to actively nurture ourselves back into wholeness. It sounds maybe less vital, this kind of work, but for those who joined us in the room that morning, who were among the first recipients of this organization's work, people fighting for queer rights in Catholic Poland, or support for people with disabilities, increasingly in increasing in number after some of the war veterans are coming across, not to mention the people that we heard from who would answer calls to go into the forest that stands between Belarus and Poland, people trying to enter the country but pushed back from either border and stuck in this never, never land where they are without food or shelter or medical support, go out to try and find these people who have issued calls for emergency relief and who see often people in distress that they can't do much for, for all of these people having a chance to regroup, to heal. It was the difference between, they said, continuing to do the work and giving up in ways small and large. You could hear the gratitude and the desperation in their voices both. The war and the refugee crisis, though, it also has brought to light all sorts of inherent inequities and biases in Polish society. And it's brought them to light in stark ways that demanded additional work and witness. To be clear, Poland deserves incredible credit from the world for taking in 1.6 million refugees and making a place for them in the country, three times the number that the next most welcoming nation, the Czech Republic, has taken in. And what showed up in the early days of the crisis, some of you may remember this, were stories of African and black refugees and Roma people at the borders who were shunted to the side, often left outside in the cold for days and nights without food or shelter, while white Ukrainians were ushered through to welcoming arms. It brought to light the anti-black prejudice that's part of Poland, and the creation that came out of it is the Alliance for Black Justice in Poland, started by young activists, some of them black Poles who have grown up never feeling like they're recognized as being Polish, asked how they can be Polish because of their black skin, but also working to support the black and African refugees who are showing up and who need support. They were incredible people doing incredible work. And we also met an organization called Foundation Toward Dialogue, this group of both Roma and non-Roma people working to challenge the place of Roma people in Poland and beyond, the position of them. Do many of you know about the Roma, this group of people who have a reputation in Europe as being wandering, wandering gypsies is the stereotype, thieves, people who um, are unreliable workers, none of which is true. Over 80% of the Roma are settled people now, just to take on that one stereotype. They're also not thieves or work shirkers, as they reminded us again and again, but they're often denied citizenship because of the stereotypes about them. Two of the leaders of that organization met us and went with us to Krakow and to Auschwitz, actually, and in part they went because the Roma also were targeted by the Nazis. And these folks had worked and organized and raised money so that they could create an incredible exhibit at Auschwitz about the Roma people and about how the Roma people were treated during World War II, but a larger history of them. 80% of their people were destroyed in the Holocaust. 
And yet they reminded us, though this exhibit, only by their hard work, was only very recently created, that in the three-hour tour of Auschwitz that you take, their exhibit isn't included because, they were told, it's too marginal in importance. We met a young Ukrainian refugee who created just a simple chat app as soon as she came so that people could, without accountability or without um, being detected, could ask for help that they needed with no stigma. So it looks like you're chatting to a person, but it's actually to a group of people who are trying to find resources and support you. Food, shelter, papers, help with work. But part of what she found is that there was this increasing number of people who were victims of gender-based violence because immigrants and refugees, women, are particularly vulnerable to that, texting and needing practical and emotional support. And so her work has moved beyond what she dreamed so that she now runs a shelter for women. They're all making it up as they go along, these people who just saw a call and answered it. All of these were UUSC partners identified when they were small organizations. And I use the word partners intentionally because UUSC wasn't only early funders, but its over 40 person staff includes a significant number of people whose whole job is to coach these grassroots groups trying to do such incredible work against the odds. Everything from fundraising to communication, technology, and the partners were so grateful, and they were grateful for every cent they got because they needed every, every piece of resource that they could have. But also, it was so clear how grateful they were to have allies who understood their issues and the perspective they were coming from, who stood with them and followed their lead. They were working for human dignity, but somebody was standing with them in the chaos of war. It was us who was standing with them. And it reminded me in the moment, listening to story after story, that wait still in Martha's work during World War II in Europe was still happening. It wasn't just the same organization that was doing humanitarian work, which is, I think, how I would have said it beforehand, but something, something deeper than that, right? It was frontline work. It was led by locals, but people who brought resources from outside, you used, who allied with the most vulnerable, who brought what resources we could, who took risks to be with them. And it struck me, it struck me how this is this momentum of the best kind something I so needed to be in touch with when I had also been in touch with this other piece of the brokenness and momentum of evil, that here were people all over this just one nation collaborating, conspiring for good, for justice, for equity. All of it also at work in the world with this momentum, like the UUSC, to carry on. Not all of it entirely planned or engineered, but something about the DNA of what happens in our own lives, in our families, in our organizations, in our nations, that we tend to and participate in. And how legacy, it struck me, legacy also ideally is us participating in that kind of momentum and conspiring. That that's how we might think about it. That we pick off sometimes where someone left off in things we believe in and we push them along and we fuel them and we shore them up and we push them past our own life and we cross our fingers and say a prayer that they continue beyond us, or we pick up something no one else has and we get it off the ground and we invite people to participate with us and we push it off into the future and we say our prayer that it continues beyond us. Because I had a professor once, he said that personal identity, what is at the core of who we are, isn't this body or this voice or any, 
any facet of our being, but actually he thought if you reduced it, if you pushed people to the wall about what they thought was the essence of who they were, it was the things they cherished in the world and served with their lives. So really, immortality, it's just about that. In that sense, legacy, though it can sound like this dusty, fossilized word, right? It's not. It's this living momentum that we participate in, that we pick up and move along. And when we see it that way, I don't know how we can't but be grateful for all the ways it's working in the world and feel hopeful about the world and about this possibility of propelling justice and healing because we're not starting from nothing. It's, it's moving toward us and through us all the time. And to remember this at Passover, that we're not just pharaohs who create the oppressions of our time or serve them, participating in them, but we're also the people who can split the seas and walk together through them and wind our way over sometimes a long time to the promised land that we dream and fail and pick ourselves up again and live into the best of the story that we want to tell and can about where we've been and who we are. And so the challenge of legacy is for us to reflect on what it is that we cherish, that we serve or want to serve better, that we want to propel forward and to the challenges of our days then, to answer the call of the poet Aurora Levins Morales, who says of the songs of justice and the work of liberation in the world this, wake up, put on your shoes, you who are reading this, I am bringing bandages and a bag of scented guavas from my trees. I think I remember the tune. Meet me at the corner. Let's go. So may it be. Amen. Oh,